I am thrilled to be joined today um, by Dr. Ronald Cohen, who is president and CEO of the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and by um, Zenia Ivakin, who is his lab director, um, and Eleonora Maino, who's, who's um, in the lab as well. And I'm going to turn things over to um, Dr. Cohen first to get us started. Daniel, you want to pull up the slides? <clears throat> All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us um, and for having us, really. Uh, I will just make a couple of brief introduc introductions and then leave the science part to the real scientists since I have become uh, only a partial scientist over the last few years. Uh, maybe go to the next slide. So I want to tell you a little bit about how we, how I and how we as a group uh, arrived at giving you even a presentation like this today. Because if you look at this slide here, I will tell you for a good 15 years of my uh, career as a scientist, um, I really have spent most of my time on either trying to identify genes trying to model a disease, trying to understand the pathophysiology of disease. At, at some point in my life, I did research around <clears throat> hibernating squirrels and why they preserve muscle mass when they go sleeping for several hours. That's for another day. And when I moved to Toronto eight years ago, about a year after I moved here, the first paper about genome editing and CRISPR, the technology you'll hear about uh, in a little bit in much more detail, uh, the first paper was published in, I printed, the, I printed the paper out and I put it on my desk and said at some point I have to read it. And um, then another paper came out a couple uh, months later and I printed this out again and I started to read it and I didn't really understand it because it was a completely different language and I was so busy with so many other things. And then uh, the Herald uh, Tribune uh, in the UK, which is like the Time Magazine kind of equivalent, published an article about how this genome editing technology is going to transform the way how we're going to treat patients one day. And <clears throat> within 24 hours, I had over 30 emails from different patients in my inbox asking me, is this something that finally will uh, help my child? So that was kind of the necessary kick in my butt, excuse me, the language, that I needed to finally sit down and read this. And I have been and continue to be still about six and a half years later, uh, mesmerized by this unbelievable technology and the unbelievable opportunities that we will have over the next many, many years. And I remember showing this paper to Jenia, who will speak right after me, and asking him, what do you think about this? He got excited and we changed our entire research in the laboratory <clears throat> uh, from, from rather studying the disease characterization and models towards how can we use genome editing as a vehicle to develop therapies for, multi, for various different genetic disorders. Soon after we made that decision, I saw a patient in my clinic, a young boy who had intellectual disability, developmental delay, low muscle tone. That's why he came to my clinic because I mainly see children with low muscle tone. And we made a diagnosis of a duplication in the MECP2 gene. And I remember speaking to Genia about this because as you will hear in a minute, the genome editing technology is pretty much on a late term basis, genetic surgery. So you can go pretty much anywhere into the genome, snip and take out what's faulty and, and then do all sorts of different things. So I was thinking if you have a duplication in a gene, wouldn't that be one of the potentially easiest applications 
of using this technology to just cut out the duplication. And then Genya got thinking because he's the scientific brain behind all of our wonderful things and started to develop a methodology and a technique of how we can utilize this genome edit editing technology to do that. And you will hear about this from him in a minute. At the same time, I want all of you to know, so here you, I'm talking about a patient of mine whom I'm still in contact with, and I got very close actually to the family over the years. At the same time, I have very close friends in London, UK, who have a boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, who also happens to have a duplication. And we utilized uh, this technology to, in cells at least, try to fix this duplication. And I have to tell you the time when my postdoc back then sent me the first pictures of how we were able to cut the duplications in both of these children's cells, probably still till today are one of the most meaningful moments of science I've ever had in my life. So that's my introduction to you. Now you get more to the technical part of how to actually do all of this. But I also would like to thank all of you for your support for our laboratory that enables us to have a creative, sometimes really crazy idea and get on with our research. So thank you very much. Over to you, Genia. Thank you, Ryan. So in terms of You're, you're muted, muted, um, Zanya. Is it good now? Is it okay now? Yes, it's fine now, but you may want okay. to back up because we missed your first few sentences. Okay. So in terms of MECP2 duplication syndrome in our lab, we are trying to basically go in two different directions. First of all, we are trying to develop cellular and animal models of the disease. And those models should faithfully recapitulate the genetic uh, mutations that happen in patients. So we are trying to model MSCP2 duplication syndrome in cells and also we are working on making an animal model and Ellie is going to talk about that, the progress. Second part of what we are trying to do, we are trying to develop genome editing technology to actually correct the duplication mutations. And it's not just applicable for MHCP2 duplication syndrome, but that strategy we believe is universal and can be applied for many different disorders as well. So I just wanted to briefly mention that uh, we are using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And I think many of you probably have heard that last year, Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to two remarkable women, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dadner, for the development of a method of genome editing based on CRISPR-Cas9. And it's actually remarkable. And I think Ronnie mentioned already in the introduction that the first paper was published only eight years ago in 2012, but that particular approach, it literally revolutionized basic research and also clinical research. And right now there are several clinical trials of using CRISPR technology. So what is CRISPR-Cas9? So you can think about it as molecular scissors. So until here, it's a Cas9 protein, and you can think about Cas9 as an autonomous vehicle. So this vehicle can go anywhere, but we also need something called guide RNA. And the guide RNA is a GPS of the vehicle, and it's going to define where this vehicle is supposed to go. So when we combine guide RNA and Cas9, 
then this complex will know where to go in the genome, where to bind and where to cut. So the whole function of Cas9 is to generate DNA double-stranded break. And after that, cellular machinery is going to recognize this break, this break and DNA repair mechanisms. If we can understand how to manipulate them, we can actually correct many different mutations in the genome, including duplication syndrome mutations. So before I talk about our strategy, just very briefly, I just mentioned about MECP2. So MECP2 is a protein that is very abundantly expressed in the nervous system and is important for function of brain cells. So MECP2 binds to methylated cytosines in DNA and basically it's a, it's a modified letter of DNA. And by binding to DNA, it can regulate production of proteins that are important for neural function. In some situations, it will increase, help to increase production. And in some situation, it's going to inhibit production of those proteins. So basically, it's a master regulator of many, many different proteins. MACP2, what is un probably unique about MACP2? that the levels of MACP2 has to be tightly regulated. So deficiency in MACP2 lead to rat syndrome phenotype. But whereas too much MACP2, but as in case with MACP2 duplication syndrome, it's a different, uh, different disease. So it's probably important to recognize here that any kind of therapeutic strategies for MACP2 duplication syndrome should keep it in mind. So we cannot overshoot. We cannot just uh, eliminate production of MECP2. Like we need to establish the balance, normal levels of MECP2. So now we will focus on the region that is duplicated in MECP2. We can recognize that different patients have different size of mutations. And in addition to MECP2, there's another gene that is pretty much always being duplicated and it's called IRAC1. So what is the function of IRAC1 in the pathophysiology of the MECP2 duplication syndrome is not currently well understood. And, uh, and as Ellie is going to mention, so our mouse model, it is the first mouse model that recapitulate IRAC1 duplication. And so we will be in a good position to address this very important question. So now just what is our strategy? How are we using CRISPR-Cas9 to try to remove pretty much any kind of duplication mutations? So wild type DNA, let's focus on this pink region here. So in a wild type DNA, we have one, the pink region. In a duplicated DNA, just imagine that this pink region is being duplicated. And right now we have pink and red together. Danya, I'm, I'm not sure if they know what wild type means. So I just want to make sure. So that's just normal, normal DNA. Yeah, correct. So that is a normal DNA. In a normal patient, we have just a pink square. And in a duplicating DNA, we have pink plus red. So twice, something is repeated twice. So we can think about it as a recipe for pasta. So, and the, so for any kind of neurological processes, we need several ingredients. And imagine that MECP2 region is important for addition of three eggs in a pasta. So we need to make good meal. We have to follow the directions precisely. But in a duplicated DNA, instead of three X, when something is duplicated right now, we are going to have white X and also brown X. Total, we are going to have six X. So it will ruin the pasta. So we are not going to produce something that we desired. And that's how duplications in, a, in DNA can lead to a disease. So we are producing something that should not be there. 
So now we are going to think how we can actually remove the duplication. And they're possible to use two different strategies if you think about it. We can basically say, okay, we can all of the brown eggs that are there, we can remove them. So just basically take all of the brown eggs out and we can make only three eggs left. And that's a strategy that can be, can be recognized as a two guys DNA removal strategy. So we have to find a guide that binds to the junction between first duplicated region A and a second duplicated region A prime. So this blue guide is going to recognize the junction between two regions. And we need another guide that is going to recognize the region just outside of the duplication. And by doing that, we can remove the great duplicating region leading to the normal control wild type DNA. But another way to re basically to restructure the, the region of DNA is to recombine two portions. So if we still need to have three eggs, we don't need just to have all of the white eggs. We can have one white egg and two brown eggs. And on a level of a DNA, it's going to look something like that. So we are going to only use one guide RNA, so guide A, and it can bind because duplicated regions have identical sequences, it can bind to the same sequence and generate a cut. And basically what we are doing, we are reconstituting the portion of DNA that right now has, basically it's a hybrid. It has some pink region and some gray region, but in essence, it, it is now becoming a normal control DNA. And there are several advantages of using this kind of strategy, because though I only showed that this blue guide can bind here, but we can design it anywhere within the duplicated region to basically establish the same strategy. So the, there are lots of choices. And second, sometimes we won't be able to find guide that binds to the junction. So the two guide strategy simply is not going to work. So this is basically the essence of the single guide strategy that we are using for MACP2 duplication uh, removal and also for other diseases. And I just going to show you a slide that, so this is something that we published in patient cells. So Ronnie mentioned that we work with patient cells in 2016. So we design a strategy to basically on a level of DNA, we can, if there's a control DNA called wild type, we are only seeing one band. But in a duplicated DNA, we are seeing two bands. So this molecular assay can discriminate how many cells we have in a dish that are wild type like and how many cells in a dish that are going to be, that are going to carry duplication. So if we use a CRISPR-Cas9 system with, uh, where there is no Cas9, so basically we just package something in the antivirus that expresses uh, GFP protein, nothing happens. So if you're looking here, where I call GFP, we are again seeing large band that corresponds to duplication and a shorter band that corresponds to wild type. So nothing is happening. But as soon as we are using CRISPR-Cas9 strategy to target somewhere within the duplication, we are getting removal of the duplication and reconstitution of the wild type region. So basically this result illustrates that on a molecular level, we are able to take cells of patients with a duplication and convert most of those cells to become wild type like. And Ronnie mentioned that how he felt about uh, it when the first time we saw that result. But actually, even right now speaking to you, I have a goosebumps because that was the first demonstration that we can take cells that 
have something wrong with them. Do manipulation, manipulation with CRISPR-Cas9 and restore normal functional copy of the protein. And right now I'm going to stop here, stop sharing my screen and Ellie will continue with the presentation about animal model of the disease. Because as soon as we got the data, we wanted to try whether we will be able to actually use the same strategy in mice. And it took us probably three years to make a mouse model. It was a lot of mistakes. And I know I remember Ellie just started here. PhD, and it was a very first project she tried in the lab. So we spent a lot of time to make, finally made a very iterative and preliminary. Okay, Ellie. Okay, I hope uh, you can hear me. My connection is a bit unstable, so please let me know if somehow you can't hear me anymore. Okay, so in the second part of this talk, I am going to show you the work that we are practically doing right now in the lab to test the efficacy of the MACP2 duplication removal to really show that it's something feasible to get preclinical data and to try to really gather data to push forward all of these new genome editing therapy in patients. So right now, and uh, um, I just want to bring you back to this slide and remind you what we are really doing in the lab related to MACP2 duplication syndrome. So we are working in two directions, which are absolutely complementary, as Jania was saying before. So on one side, we're really trying to develop new models because it's extremely important to start having a reliable mouse model and cellular model that recapitulate patient mutations. And we are doing this by generating and characterizing a novel MACP2 duplication mouse model. And at the same time, we are working on cellular models to really like try to represent small, big, every type of size of duplication that is causing the syndrome. On the other side, we are utilizing CRISPR-Cas9 to develop novel therapies that can be applied to remove duplications. And as Genia has explained to you, as we already did a proof of concept experiment in vitro in cells derived from a MACP2 duplication patient, and we were able to demonstrate that our approach can indeed remove a duplication. Right now, we are focusing in translating this approach in vivo in our newly generated mouse model. And at the same time, we are really trying to push and expand it to all of the MACP2 duplications. So today I'm going to focus mainly on the in vivo work that we are doing right now. So at this point, there are no mouse models available that are recapitulating MACP2 patients' mutations. There are mouse models which are really, really good and, and, been, and have been really crucial to study and understand this disease. But these mice are generated in a slightly different ways. So in these mice, we have a, a copy of the MACP2 gene, which is expressed many, many times in the genome. And in these ways, these mice express more MACP2, exactly like what we see in patients. And they do show phenotypes of the disease. And they have been extremely important, for example, for therapeutic development of antisense oligonucleotide-based therapies. However, the uh, drawback of these mice is that they really do not recapitulate the duplication mutation. So we really don't have a copy of the DNA, which is exactly followed by a copy of the DNA, which is the exact same one. That is genetic landscape that we can find in patients. Moreover, Jania has been already bringing this up during this presentation. In these mice, we do not have any duplication of the IRAC1 gene, which is always found duplicated in patients and might play a big role in uh, disease symptoms and manifestation. So for this reason, we really can't utilize these mice for testing our single guide RNA approach. So yes, when I started my PhD, I tried to generate a mouse model that had this duplication, but this process of generating mouse model with duplication is extremely complicated, but we finally made it, uh, especially thanks to our collaborator, Dr. Bingu, 
we develop a new strategy to generate duplications and mouse model having duplications. So I won't go in detail at all of the strategy because it's really complex, but right now we were able to generate the first mouse model having a real duplication of the genes IRAC1 and MACP2, which are always found duplicated in patients plus some other genes. And long story short, we were able to sequence the genome of this mouse. What you see here in the middle is the output of a sequencing analysis. And we were able to find, to find a junction between the first and the second copy, meaning that the genome of the mouse is exactly like we are expecting it and recapitulates the landscape that we can find in patients. With another technique, we were able to look for the copy number of the genes contained in duplicated region, and both for the genes IRAC1 and MACP2, our mice have two copies of these genes, while the wild-type mice, the normal mice, show only one copy. So we know that we have a mouse model that really recapitulates the genetic duplication found in patients. This is extremely important because it's the first time that we have a model that is faithfully recapitulating mutations that has a duplication of both MACP2 and IRAC1. So IRAC1 is a very important gene for immune response and is really understudied in the context of MACP2 duplication syndrome, even if patients often show recurrent respiratory recurrent infections. And we think that this gene might really play a role in all of these, and it will be really interesting to better understand this contribution to the disease. So with this model, we can really start understanding the disease, the mechanism, and utilize it for our uh, genetic approaches to remove duplications. So after we found out that we have the exact model we wanted, we went on and we tried to analyze it and understand if it were really uh, representative of the disease. So first of all, we started looking at the expression of MACP2 and IRAC1 in the brain of these mice. So we really want to see if the duplication is leading to an increased expression of the genes which are present in the duplication. So here on the left, you see two plots which are representative of an analysis that we do on the RNA of these mice. And uh, you can see that our MACP2 duplication mice, for what regards MACP2 and what regards IRAC1, show about twice the expression of the RNA compared to wild type mice, meaning that the genes that are duplicated are being expressed twice as much as wild types. Here you also see a third group of mice, which are MACP2 deletion mice. So at the same time that we were generating this mouse model, we also generated a second mouse, which does not have at all in the genome the region that is duplicated, and we, we utilize it as a control for our experiment. And as we would expect, since these mice don't have this gene, we can't detect any expression of the genes. Here on the right panel, you can see what we call a Western blotting. So this is a technique that we utilize in the lab to look for protein expression. And uh, basically the strongest is a band, the highest the protein is expressed. And also in this case, if you look at the top panel, you can see how MACP2 is more expressed in the wild types compared to the, uh, in, sorry, in the duplication mice compared to the wild types because the band is stronger and is not expressed at all in the MACP2 deletion mice. And the same trend, we can see it here for the IRAC1 gene, where we have the band for the MACP2 mice, which are on average stronger than the wild types, even if in this case, the expression of this gene is a bit more variable among different mice. So we confirm that our genes are being expressed and they are being increased in compared to the levels of our wild type mice. So now we really want to see if the overexpression of this gene is leading to the onset of any type of disease manifestation in these mice. And uh, we would expect so because we know that all of the other mouse models representative for MACP2 duplication syndrome that have an overexpression of this gene actually develop a phenotype. So the way in which we started to look at this is by analyzing the way in which the neurons are responding in the brain. 
So when we talk about MACP2 duplication syndrome, we are really thinking about a neurological disorder in which the brain is really playing a huge role in all of these disease manifestations and symptoms. So there is a technique in which we can take an electrode, stimulate a specific neuronal group in the brain of these mice, and with a different electrode, we can measure how much a different group of neurons is really responding to this stimulation. So we can measure on in the brain of the mice their neuronal activity and the way in which neurons are excited by a signal. So we did this analysis in collaboration for, with Mike Salter lab at SickKids and especially like Dr. Ong Min Lee really did all of this study. And in this plot, on the right, you can really see that the MACP2 duplication mice show increased neuronal excitability and activity compared to wild type mice. So this abnormal level of uh, activity of the neurons is actually something that we can somehow correlate with some of the symptoms and manifestation which are observed in patients in which we have seizures, we can have epilep ep epilepsy, and these might really be due to a different way in which neurons are excited in the brain. So our mice are probably like pretty well recapitulating at least some aspects of the disease. We then moved on and we tried to look more at the overall behavior of the mice. And right now we focus in looking at the motor coordination of these mice. So in the lab, there are a lot of very unique tests that we can utilize to look at how the mice are behaving and uh, showing symptoms. One of these is called Rotterod. So basically we have a huge wheel and we place the mice on the wheel and the mice are working on the wheel. And we are measuring how quick they are falling off the wheel. The quicker a mouse is falling off the wheel, uh, the most likely this mouse has some kind of locomotor impairment. Um, and uh, we aged our mice up to one year old, and then we did this test on a three days. And uh, in this plot, you can see that our MACP2 duplication mice, which are represented in red, over the three days period, always started to fall off sooner from the wheel. And this is usually a measure that is suggesting us that this mouse model has an impaired motor coordination, which is something that can be recapitulated also if we think about how uh, patients show their symptoms. And also in some of the other transgenic mice for this syndrome, this kind of phenotype has been previously reported. Another way in which you can look for a neurobehavior in a mouse, check if its neuronal activity is fine, if the mouse is behaving properly, is to look at how active the mice are in an open field chamber. So this is a different test. And we basically have a box. We place the mouse in the middle of the box and there is a camera on top of it. So this camera is going to measure how much the mouse is exploring the area around it, how much the mouse is jumping, walking, how fast it is and we can get a lot of parameters out of it. So in this case, our MACP2 duplication mouse show increased activity in the open field chamber. They traveled more in the chamber, as we can see from this plot, and they also show increased vertical activity. So they are just exploring more, traveling more, moving more in the chamber. And we think that this phenotype is somehow a representation of their increased excitability of their neurons. So right now we are pretty happy with what we have. We really have a mouse model that is recapitulated genetic mutations that we have in patients. This mouse model is expressing more MACP2 and more IRAC1. And at the same time, this mouse model is showing some symptoms which can be related to what we see in patients. Right now we are still uh, doing some further experiment to do some cognitive tests, check early stages of disease in order to see how the disease is, is progressing. But for sure, we know that we have a good model that we can utilize to test our CRISPR-Cas9 approach, because we also have some phenotypes, some measures that we can look at to check if our treatment is working. So let's see how we can translate our single guide RNA strategy into the MACP2 duplication mice. Okay, as before, we have to go back to their DNA, which is the most important aspect for our approach. So in the MACP2 duplication mice, we have a duplication of the genes IRAC1 and other genes, 
And so basically we have the same sequence repeated twice again in the genome. So we can design one guide RNA that as Jania showed you before, is going to target both copies of the duplicated region. And upon Cas9 cutting, we are going to remove the middle part of the duplication. And we are going to restore the normal gene copy number. And in the end, we will have only one copy of MACP2 and one copy of IRAC1, exactly like we would expect in a normal wild type situation. So this is great, but how do we really like deliver this treatment to these mice? How can we make it go in the cells we want to target? So for this approach, we are taking our single guide CRISPR-Cas9 components and we are packaging them in a viral vector, which is called the associated viral vector serotype 9. So this viral vector has been previously utilized to target neuronal cells in the brain, which are here the main cells which we think are affected by the disease. So we really want to try to remove a duplication from these cells. And uh, this vector has also been utilized already in the context of gene therapy for rat syndrome. So we know it probably can be a good candidate to try our approach. So the way in which the vector works, is just works like a vehicle, which is bringing the Cas9 inside the cells. And now we have a second problem. Where do we deliver our viral vector containing our therapeutic agents? Again, in MACP2 duplication syndrome, we really want to hit the brain because we want to try to probably remove duplications from neuronal cells. And uh, so the approach that we are using right now, we are injecting mice pups when they are just born at P0. That is the day that we usually call the day of birth of a mouse. And we inject these pups in a specific brain region, which is called ventricle. So in the brain, we have these cavities, which are filled with a fluid. And by injecting the viral vector in these cavities, this fluid is helping to really spread the virus in also different brain areas. And right now, we are at a very exciting point in the lab, because we actually just injected our first two groups of mice. And we are right now aging them up to six weeks to start analyzing the effects of the treatment. And then we will further look at the treatment in a later time point, so when the mice are about six months old, to see if the effects are really sustained over time. And so I can show you this, I can't show you this result right now, but I really hope that next time that we meet each other, we will be able to share the results related to this part of the project. So the real therapeutic efficacy in vivo of the single guide RNA strategy in the context of MACP2 duplication syndrome. So now, before ending this presentation, I just want to quickly touch upon the work that we are doing in vitro in order to model different type of MACP2 duplication in neuronal derived cells, neuronal like cells. So this work is made by a brilliant graduate student in the lab, which is Summer. And uh, in her master project, Summer is trying to model different size of MACP2 duplication. So there are a few reasons why we are interested in doing this. So first of all, different size of MACP2 duplication will have different genes duplicated. And we might think that different genes are going to really have a different impact on the disease progression, onset, and severity. And on the other side, we really want to try to see if our single guide approach is able to remove duplication of different sizes. So we want to see if we have any limit in our approach. And there is something which is very, very interesting about a different type and different size of duplication. All of the duplication will still have a commonly duplicated region, which is basically made by the genes IRAC1 and MACP2, which are duplicated in all of the patients. So we can take advantage of this, design a guide RNA which targets this commonly duplicated region. And again, upon Cas9 cutting, we should be able to remove all of the duplication. So in this way, one guide, which is tested once, 
so which is optimized once might be really utilized to treat all of the patients having a MACP2 duplication. Right now, we still don't have this data, but we have a few cells with different size of duplications and we'll start working on this side of the project pretty soon. So before leaving you, I want to tell you a few of the really point of strength of this project and of the single guide treatment. So I hope I've been able to show you that the single guide RNA approach is a pretty versatile approach that has the potential to be translated to all of the MACP2 duplication. One of the important aspects of this treatment is that it can potentially be a one-time treatment. So if we are able to target the most number of neurons as we can, we can potentially inject patients just once remove the duplication and achieve a therapeutic effect with just one injection. At the same time, uh, Cas9 in this approach is really targeting non-coding region of the genome. This means that we have a lot of flexibility in the way in which we can design our guide RNA. As Jania was explaining you toward the beginning of this presentation, the single guide RNA has this huge advantage that can really be designed in any part of our duplication. So we can choose regions where we do not have genes. So we, if we choose region in between genes, even if we have a small mistake, this mistake should be more tolerated by the cell. And finally, we really want to make a point here. So we think about the single guide RNA like an, a universal approach to remove duplication mutation as a broad group of disorders. So this is pretty powerful because when we are talking about rare disorder, we have usually a small group of patients and it's very hard to develop different therapies for any group. So if we can really have a strategy that can be translated among different diseases, starting from the same type of mutation, this can really help uh, moving this field further and can really push to move this therapy in the clinic faster. And to reiterate this point, I want to show you briefly the work that we did in another context. So even Ron in the beginning mentioned our work on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So while in the lab we were starting to work on MACP2 duplication in vitro, at the same time, we also started to work on the MD duplication. And uh, even in this case, we didn't have a mouse model. And what we have been able to do is to generate a mouse model having a duplication that is causing Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So the phenotype of Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a severe muscle wasting. And in this image here, you can see a cross section of a muscle and all of these dots, which are in the middle of the fiber are meaning that the fiber are not healthy. All of these cells that you see here in between muscle fiber are mean as well that the muscle is not healthy. And the mice show a very severe phenotype. They are not working well, they have problems. And the genome of this mouse has a duplication, which is represented here in the dystrophin gene, which is causing the disease. So we were able to generate a mouse model. We treated the mouse model with the single guide approach. And upon Cas9 cutting, we were able to remove the duplication and restore the normal gene. And this led to a phenotypic improvement of the mouse. Now this muscle looks very healthy. You don't have any more these central nuclei in the muscles and these mice really recover their locomotor function. And this is the manifestation that the single guide approach has the potential to really be able to revert syndrome, symptoms or improve the disease manifestation in all of this disorder. And we really hope that we're going to see the same type of results in the context of MACP2 duplication syndrome pretty soon. So with this presentation, I hope we have been able to show you how powerful the CRISPR-Cas9 technology can be to remove duplication mutation and how CRISPR-Cas9 is probably going to be the future of how we treat and how we found a cure for rare inherited disorder. So before finishing, I just want to leave you with some challenges that are still there before moving this therapy further into the clinic. So Cas9 is pretty specific, but still can have some of target effects. 
So sometimes the protein can cut in regions which are similar, but not exactly where we wanted it to go. So all of these aspects has to be really, really further evaluated for the safety of the approach. On the other side, both uh, viral delivery vectors and Cas9 by itself can create an immune response in the people which are injected. And so right now the field is also trying to find alternatives, for example, delivery, for example, developing nanoparticle uh, that can work as a vector to bring in the therapeutic components, components. And then we can really, we really have to study each disorder by itself to find the best therapeutic window to have the best possible outcome for the patients which are treated. And with this, I want to thank all of the members of Ronnie's and Jania's lab, uh, especially want to thank Summer, which is uh, collaborating, is working with me on this project and is taking care of all of the cellular part of the project. Uh, I want to thank Sana, which is our mouse technician that has been helping out with all of the behavioral testing. Uh, Bean, our collaborator, which has been crucial in generating the MACP2 duplication mouse model and Mike Salter and Ong Nin Lin, which help us with the electrophysiology. Finally, obviously, a huge thank to the Reverse Red Foundation, to Monica for having us here today, funding us, and letting us share with you how our research is progressing in this field. Thank you all for participating in this talk, for listening to us, and I guess we are ready to take questions. Great, that was really interesting. And I, I hope that everyone found that helpful. So um, before we take some questions, I'll just, I'll just make the point that it's because of um, families fundraising efforts that we have the ability to fund projects like this. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's so important um, when you're dealing with a rare disease to, to get active um, and, and to help push the science forward. So to all the families that are on today, those of you that have actually helped with these, um, to be able to raise this money, we're very, very grateful. Okay, so we do have some questions. Um, and so I'll, I'll take the question from Pat first. Did I, under, did I understand correctly that Eleonora's research developed a better MECP2 mouse, MECP2 under RAC1? Is this a mouse that would benefit the other research approaches in addition to the CRISPR one? You're, you're muted, muted. Okay, yeah, I'll take these. So, Obviously, every model, even what was generated before, is a very good model. So I guess we just added an extra step in which, yes, we have a true duplication. And we also duplicated IRAC1 gene, which has a real, uh, which might play a big role in this disease. So this mouse model will definitely be helpful for all of the, res the research on MACP2 duplication syndrome, not only for our specific approach, but we really want to try to start putting our work together to share it with the community in order to make it available to researchers that are working on this disease. Great, thank you. Um, another question from um, Randall. My understanding is that to get these <clears throat> editors into the brain, we need to have gene therapy working at a much better efficiency than the current state. Are you doing any work in this area to develop better gene therapy vectors? You, starting a, you started to address that at the end of your presentation. Do you want to elaborate a little bit? Yeah, maybe I can, I can try to answer. So like right now, we are using a benign vector because that's what's being currently used in clinic a lot. But there are better vectors already exist that target neural population at least in mice very efficiently. For example, AV EPHB vector is a is a better vector. It just it doesn't work in primates and it doesn't basically we can extrapolate that probably it's not an ideal vector to use in patients. But this is a gigantic area of research, like viral development, and many, many people are working trying to develop vectors, AV vectors that are going to be very specific and uh, that would get into neuronal cells and also expressed at higher levels. In addition, 
we are collaborating with a group from University of Toronto to develop nanoparticles. So ideal treatment would be because Cas9, we only need transiently Cas9 to be present in cells. So ideally it would be to deliver something in cells, Cas9 does a job and it disappears. So those are the two areas of research we are pursuing. And, you know, we, we, every neurological disease um, that needs to be treated and where you need to get a genetic solution to the brain, right, a, a genetic therapeutic to the brain, it has the same problem. Um, and, and right now the gold standard is, is AEV9. Um, it's been in many people, it's, it's safe. Um, there, you know, as, as Zenya said, there's a huge effort ongoing um, to try to find a better one. Um, but until that happens, we have AV9 um, as, you know, as our gold standard. And it will probably get to enough cells, you know, to have an effect. I mean, that's, that's the expectation. Um, yeah. So Amy asks, is CRISPR-Cas9 different than CRISPR? I usually see it written as CRISPR only. It's the same thing, right? Yes. Yeah. So I think right now, so CRISPR-Cas9 or CRISPR, so what we talk right today about is a first iteration of CRISPR. So those are, those are molecular scissors. But right now people can start seeing maybe in the literature, CRISPR based based editing. So based editing is a novel iteration of CRISPR. So it doesn't cut, it doesn't generate double thread and break, but it can edit basis of DNA. And then even newer development is a prime editing. So, so that's what people can see in the literature, CRISPR, because people can see CRISPR-based based editing or prime editing. But in general, typically, yeah, if, if somebody just said CRISPR, it probably means just cutting. So CRISPR-Cas9. Okay, so there's a number of people that are asking the question that all parents want to know. How long would it take to go to clinical trial, number one? Um, and number two, what kind of improvements would be, you know, would we expect to see? Would it be reversal of symptoms? Would it be um, stopping the, a, a deterioration? And I know those are really tough questions to answer. Um, let, me, but... let, me, let me try to take this one. Okay. Um, it's always really difficult to put a timeline on when, <clears throat> when can we think about clinical trials. Uh, and in this case, particularly, we need to really finish a few more uh, critical animal experiments to know whether what we want to see in animals, we are actually going to see. Um, I think realistically speaking, this is probably at least three to five years away from uh, from a clinical trial if the experiments work well. The other question about the reversibility, I'm going to answer this in two ways. Number one, there will be a time over the next three to 10 years where more and more of these genome editing technologies are going to be viable therapies for many different disorders and I believe that for the rest of my own career and the longer career of Ella and others one of the critical questions we will have to answer is what's the therapeutic window of a treatment when is it still beneficial now without creating too much uh, excitement we do need to recognize that Huda Zogby several years ago showed that in an animal model of Rett syndrome, which is obviously different, but it's a, an animal model with severe cognitive neurological deficit, they were able to reverse some of the neurological phenotype. Now, whether that is very specific to a mouse and whether it's even more specific to Rett syndrome, we don't know, but conceptually speaking, I think what this showed to us is that not every neurological abnormality, even if you are born with this, is necessarily irreversible. So 
So who, who does sh actually did show it in duplication? Adrian Bird showed it in, in Rett syndrome. Right. So but we do have it for both diseases, which is encouraging. I was right. just about to say that there is something about the MECP yeah. gene related disorders that might be beneficial. Yeah. So actually that leads us to the last question because we're, we're hitting the, um, the hour mark. But one of, one of the, Marvin asks, how is the how is your work different from the work of Dr. Zogby, who's using um, ASOs? Can you address that? So maybe I'll try. So Huda Zogby mouse model is different. So they used, uh, if I remember, human MHCP2 on the bacterial artificial chromosome to integrate in the mouse genome. So it allowed them to use human specific antisense oligos to be able to suppress production of human MECP2 on the, in the murine model. So it's an ideal situation. And in that regard, like our mouse model can also be used for antisense oligo research because still it's not, it is not clear how much antisense oligos has to be delivered to actually to bring the level of MECP2 protein to a normal level. So we don't want to suppress it too much and I don't want it to be just, just a slight reduction. So that's how it, that's the main difference. So it's a different model, like we would not be able to use their model with our approach because it's just genetically very different, but they can use our model for their approach. And I'll just add, there, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways of, a, of approaching a problem. And um, I think, it, at least for, for example, in, in Rett syndrome, we have six different strategies that we're using, you know, gene replacement, RNA, yeah. editing, DNA editing, protein replacement, reactivation. We want to do the same thing in duplication. I think it's, you know, the more different strategies we have in the, that are uh, being pursued in parallel, the more shots on goal. Um, and, absolutely. And if I can just add one thing on this, I think that what is very unique about this approach is that we really are not going into the direction in which we are going to have too little MACP2. So we won't be able to convert the phenotype into a rat syndrome phenotype, which is something that might happen if antisense oligonucleotides are targeting too much, for example, which doesn't seem like the case, but in this way, we can really tightly regulate the idea of having only one copy left if we target enough neurons, obviously. Great. Well, we've hit the hour mark. There are a few unanswered questions, and they're not ones I can answer. So I will, I will email um, probably Ellie um, or, or Zenia and, um, and get answers back to um, the parents that are asking those questions. Please do. But thank you so much. This is exciting work. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone that's um, participating today that we wish you Godspeed and um, we look forward to the next update. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.